station wagons, shooting brakes, avants. Oh, there is something magical about estate cars. And this is one of the classic examples of a great estate car, isn't it? The Audi RS6 Avant. Actually, this is an RS6 Performance, the new one. And I'm afraid that this is the last Audi RS6 as you know it. Now, to create this, Audi took an RS6 and well, ripped the turbos out of the 4-litre V8 and replaced them with bigger ones and more boost pressure. So it's now got 621 brake horsepower, which is a lot for a family estate car, but it's only 30 more than you get from a standard RS6. But anyway, you still go from 0 to 60, 0 0.2 seconds quicker than the standard car. So 3.4 seconds off the line. And then they've just done other fiddling bits, little tweaks. So. This bulkhead here, that's had eight kilos of soundproofing ripped out of it. And there are new 22 inch lightweight alloy wheels that you've seen outside. They look gorgeous, don't they? And they say five kilos per corner in unsprung weight, which has got to be useful for handling. Now, I've never been to San Francisco before, but I was warned it is um, quite steep. As you can see, yeah, there's um, a bit of a hill here. So this is where having the performance, having that extra 30 horsepower, yeah, it does, it does just really, really help. But this really is one of the last hurrahs for the blood and thunder V8-powered RS6 Avant. Because the future for this car, like for all Audis, is to go e-tron. The next RS6 will be a fully electric super wagon. Imagine if that was your driveway. Look at that. <laughs> But we'll come back to the car later because I haven't come all the way to San Francisco just to sample an RS6 with another 30 horsepower. You see, America is the spiritual home of the SUV and here the truck is king. And that means if you're a long roof enthusiast in the USA, you're a bit of a weirdo. So today I thought we'd celebrate the niche cult of the great estate with a little gathering I've put together. Welcome to Top Gear's Festival of Wagon. I got 10 of the biggest estate car fanatics on the West Coast to meet me in a backstreet parking lot so I could ask them one question. In a land where you could drive anything, what makes estate cars so special? I love estate cars because they're the perfect combination of performance, comfort, and practicality. Here in the US, there's not a lot of wagons and we wanted to be a little bit different. It's kind of like a truck but uh, like one that your mom drives. It's enough space for the family, the dogs, we can put the kids in the back. It's subtle and it's timeless. Just always like the, the long sleek look. <laughs> There's nothing else out there like them. A wagon is just a beach cruiser to have in the, in the West Coast. A wagon kind of is, it's almost like a little insider's club. I think if you're into wagons, there's a network of other people that love wagons as well. And that network was so keen to hang out, we actually had a few more cars arrive in our tiny little car park than expected. So allow me to introduce them and their very proud owners. This came about because again, I had a growing family. This little old lady had it, owned it her entire life. I got this cool little log book everywhere she went and got gas, what she had paid for it, where she went. Um, so I had a good story, um, but it had to have some life and some performance to it. So you've got kind of the original patina paint all throughout. And I kept some of that when we redid the interior, but replaced all the interior. Uh, sitting on a full speed tech chassis, LT4 pushing about 700 horsepower to a 10 speed automatic, and the car just rips. A lot of people say that their car is a sleeper. This is a 2005 E55 AMG station wagon with about 600 foot pounds of torque, and it is gorgeously subtle. I also drive it up over the Sierras to go fly fishing, and I sleep in the back. It's a sleeper. I just adore this car. Every time I get in it, hit the go button, it puts a smile on my face. People come up to me in parking lots all the time and, and ask if I'd sell this, but I'd trade it for the Audi. This car they made 1,292 of, which is pretty low. 1,300 of a car coming from General Motors in the 50s is a minuscule number for them. So there's not very many left today. Um, 
My wife and I had a daughter a number of years ago when we had the baby, I thought, you know, probably makes sense to have something I could take her to school in. That was my thought. And um, I looked really hard for a two-door wagon, partially because I think two-door wagons look a bit cooler than a four-door wagon and a child can't fall out of the back. They couldn't open the door and jump out was my practical side. And um, found this car, it was completely dilapidated. Floors rotted out, sides smashed in, rust everywhere. And I spent about three years bringing it back. I bought this car after I was working on cars. I was working on Ratatouille when I bought this car. Um, I have the car still that I drove during the making of cars. And, um, you know, we tried to get some cool hot rods and customs in the movie, but at the same time, the story has to come first. And it was really about Lightning McQueen and Mater and Sally and Doc. And so that's the movie you see. But there's some great little 50s car references in there. Now, we will get back to the wagons in a moment because you've got to see what's coming next. But I just want to have a quick talk about the venue that we've borrowed for Top Gear's Estate of the Union. This is Fantasy Junction in Emeryville, San Francisco. And I said, could we borrow your parking lot to put some old estate cars in? And they said, yeah, no problem. Fill your boots because um, we've got all our other cool stuff inside. So come with me. You've got to see what's behind this door. <laughs> What a toy box. Right, come on then, let's get stuck in because the variety in here, you could lose yourself for weeks. I mean, where else are you gonna find a continuation Ford GT40 Roadster opposite the last three litre Bentley ever made, 1929. That absolutely stunning, half a million dollars to you, which I know because they've given me the price list to browse, not because I can afford it. Uh, the most expensive thing on here, since you ask, is a Maserati one of one Indianapolis Coupe, $1.4 million. Right, come with me down here. Scariest thing in here is apparently this Lola single seater. Looks terrifying. What I love that there's so much variety in bookends as well. Let's say you're in the market for a Porsche 911. What type? If you want to do lap times, GT3 RS, there with the Vice Sack pack on, very desirable. Or oh, there's 964s and 993s. Oh, and lurking down here, we have a Aston Martin DB4 Superleggera. Makes me go a bit weak at the knees. This is a Plymouth, I know that because it says Plymouth on it. I don't really know a lot about American cars of this era, to be honest with you, but I do know something that's been signed by Richard Petty and has a turquoise steering wheel, then it is very, very special. Look at the wings on this. Aston Martin racing car next to Eagle prepared lightweight E-Type. I mean, I don't breathe in its general direction because it's worth more money than the GDP of England. Ferraris, of course, more E-Types, you're just tripping over them. Uh, new mid-engine Corvette, yes, they've got new stuff, but 1949 Jaguar XK120 with the wheel spats. Lordy Lord, I mean, it's, absolutely stunning. They've even got, I don't know if you've noticed this behind me, but the wallpaper, it's not just posters of cars, they're all pictures of cars parked right outside here that have been sold here from Fantasy Junction. They've been in business quite a few decades and they're doing a good old trade. I mean, if this is what the inside of your head looks like when you're planning your fantasy garage, then I think you can agree this is a pretty stunning building. But all I would say is that no matter what car collection you're after, what you fantasize about buying with that lottery win, there needs to be space in your garage for a fast family estate car. Speaking of sensible practicality, is anyone else feeling a need for Swede? Now, you can't have an estate car meet without having a big slice of Volvo, do you? You need a Swedish box and uh, this one doesn't belong to me. No, this belongs to Spencer, one of the guys from Fancy Junction. And among the Maseratis and Ferraris and all the unobtainium in there, this is also for sale. It's done 95,000 miles, though you'd never know it from this immaculate boot carpet and the unmarked dog guard here. It's just the consumer all-rounder, isn't it? Two and a half litre, five cylinder engine in the front, 300 horsepower, four wheel drive. Yeah, I would have loved to have been taken to school in one of these. Right, next. Audis came to my life in about 2009. Um, fast forward, this is my fifth one, but this one is a special one. I used to follow this car when I was getting into the scene and this is one of the more uh, 
well-known cards and it's been through a lot of areas here in the US. Uh, it's a wide body, it's a converted uh, wide body. Uh, have the BVS's, LM's. Uh, this is a stage three minus, nothing huge, just RS6 turbos. This is more of like a cruiser. <laughs> yeah. I have, I, I used to have a silver B8 uh, wagon and then I saw this and I kind of wanted it. At first it was for my son, but um, I kind of took it because my husband has a yellow Avant as well, an Imola, except his is a sedan and it's a B5. So we kind of have it his and hers. So the mods that we've done is we've just lowered it, put on some BC coilovers, which stage one, ET specs tuning, put the roof box, wanted to keep it as original as possible. Um, it was under 100,000 miles, couldn't pass it up. So that's my car. <laughs> so I really like stupid projects. I had a vision before I had kids of having a lifted Audi. I liked old Audis. Uh, it was kind of my thing. And so I started with a coupe and I lifted that and had a lot of fun with it. My wife and I took it camping all the time. Uh, and then she got knocked up. So we needed something that was gonna hold car seats. I proposed it to her. Uh, I showed her a Craigslist ad for a car with a blown engine and a salvage title and uh, said we should probably go buy this. And, and yeah, here it is. So I put an engine in it, built some long travel suspension for it, big tires, and uh, it's good. It's, it's fun. The ground clearance is a little high so it doesn't quite kill the zombies. But uh, we do have an axe on the roof, so just in case, you know, you can take them out. In fact, our friend Kirk is so obsessed with wagons, he didn't just bring one on his 14-hour drive from Seattle, he asked a mate along so he could show off his other dream Audi, this delectable RS2. When I was in high school, uh, there was a kid that had a silver Audi 80 uh, two-door sedan, but I kind of just fell in love with that body style and got really into it, and I love wagons and like the ultimate wagon was an RS2. And they were on Obtanium, Forbidden Fruit, and then the opportunity came up, a buddy of mine had imported one. The next weekend I was on a plane, flew to buy it, um, gave him a check, immediately uh, drove it home. It was like October, I hit, I wasn't expecting snow, I hit snow in three states on somewhere only tires and the thing did awesome. Um, you know, like the ultimate like quattro experience for a first day of ownership. It's my dream car. That's just, yeah, it's kind of everything I always wanted. And since we're on the subject of great fast Audis, it's probably time I told you a bit more about the latest, greatest RS6. Right, the first thing you need to know is that you can't buy the normal RS6 anymore. That's dead. You may only now buy the performance with 630 horsepower and there's some token weight saving, isn't there? But I'm not sure I am getting a lot more noise through the bulkhead with that removed soundproofing. And yeah, okay, the lighter wheels have helped the ride. There's no doubt about that. You can sense there's a bit less unsprung weight, but you've got to be concentrating to notice it. But the main reason I was a bit skeptical about why the performance wouldn't really live up to the name, was just the fact that the M3 Touring now exists. BMW is now the king of the German Uberwagens. And I just didn't know if Audi with this platform, it's always been a lot more numb and doesn't have the M3's kind of attack of the modes to make it conquer any situation. Just didn't think this could really get close to it. And while it's got adaptive suspension, an active rear differential and four wheel steering, I still somehow suspected the performance would be a 110,000 pound teleportation pod with a suede steering wheel. And actually when I first got into this yesterday and spent a few hours in it and quite a few miles, I was sort of having my prejudices confirmed, you know, wallopingly fast in a straight line, but ultimately not hugely memorable. But then if you do delve into here and you play around with your RS mode and you start acting like a bit of an RS hole, then you can set up the Quattro Sport Differential, which is new for the performance, that's been retuned. And Audi have done this before. They've said, well, we've got this differential and it sends all the power to the back, aren't we clever? And you go, no, because it never feels like that in real life. It feels like something that it mathematically says it can do on a graph. But if you are prepared to drive this RS6 like a complete Wally, and I'm not endorsing that, but if you are prepared to go full tool, then this is an RS6 that can do yobbery. It can do stuff like this. Oh, 
Ferrari in an RS6. <laughs> Never driven an RS6 that's got that amount of agility and adjustability to it. For, you know, an understeermeister, this is pretty sensational. They are learning. We got a clue to that last year with that RS4 competition, special edition, any of the few units, but it had this adjustable coilover suspension and it did feel a bit more rear bias. It's strange, isn't it? Right at the end of a car's production run at the moment, Audi seems to be unlocking a bit of the fun factor right before everything goes electric. Stuff I'm not so sure about. Uh, the gearbox down changes are just a bit sluggish. As usual, rubbish seats in a fast Audi. It just feels like you're sitting on a whale's tongue. No support, don't have the sense of occasion. Really expensive car, should have better seats. The worst thing for me is the brake pedal. It's just so over servoed. I don't know why Audi keeps doing this. It just gives you all the bite right at the top of the pedal and you're constantly headbutting the steering wheel, which is a bit of a pity. On oh, the other weird thing is that it sounds best on part throttle. That's where you get the V8 burble. When you actually, let's drop it down into second out of this bend, give it everything. It's actually quite breathy. You get a lot of turbo kind of rush. Whereas if you upshift and then go into the throttle there, yeah, see that sounds much bassier. I mean, despite those weight savings, this is still a monster. It's 2.1 tons. I have to say, for an RS6, this is pretty wild. And away from all the, you know, the pluses, the minuses, the likes and dislikes, honestly, I would not blame you if you just bought the RS6 because of the way it looks. It is evil on wheels, this thing. It's all muscle and menace and shoulders. And in this inky black as well, oh, I mean, it just looks so punchy, so brooding. Makes me wonder how that will age, really. How will this look when it's 50 or 60 years old? Because um, some estate cars do age rather well. This car here is sat in my driveway from 1985 to 99, 98. Then I found Cole Foster, well-known car and motorcycle builder. I just said, I want a car that is running, but look what I got, more than running. Everything I thought of, he would bite his lip and shake his head. No, 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 no. I have it. I have the plans already made out. You know, weekend drive to car events, maybe almost every weekend. You know, I just follow the younger crowd and, uh, you know, they lead the way. It's just, don't get lost. Follow us. <laughs> so this car is 19 feet long and uh, it fits in my garage barely. <laughs> uh, I have about a foot on each end to uh, squeeze through, but uh, it came into my life by uh, a gentleman in New Jersey who wanted to trade. I had a 36 Dodge, uh, five window coupe. Uh, when it arrived all all uh, plain white and with nothing on it, I decided to make a beach cruiser. I just didn't know it was gonna be an awesome wagon like this one. Uh, a lot of people think like, oh, it's a Ghostbusters car, everything. Tell them, oh, it's a, it's a 59 Cadillac, a Ghostbusters car, so they, I have to let them know it's a 1960 Buick, but that's the rare part about this car is the fact that no one hardly ever sees a 60 Buick LeSabre wagon. Uh, right away they see a white wagon classic and it's a Ghostbusters car. I, I like correcting people a lot when it comes to that. It's fun. <laughs> I went down to buy a, a, a sedan and the salesman, I said he was the best salesman in the world. He said, hey, before you buy this car, I want you to come inside and look at this car. And I looked at it and I couldn't believe that such a beautiful car could exist. And the uh, guy sitting at the desk in front said, I'm going to be really sad because I've been looking at this car for six months and now it's going to disappear. And so I said, that's, that's the wagon for me right there. Looking forward to uh, passing it down to the next generation. I'd hope so. So <laughs> maybe I'll get a turn at the wheel. Not while I'm alive. <laughs> I think this evening sums up what's wonderful about being a petrol head. That sense of community you can find when complete strangers are all united by having common ground and love for one sort of car. I know the SUV crossover now rules the car world, but you can keep them. Wagons are where it's at. I like big boots and I cannot lie. 